what I wanted to talk about was the uh, creation of the different living species. Of course, that was discussed in this previous chapter. And there was uh, some discussion there of how various generations of living beings were produced by uh, Svayambhuva Manu. So that particular discussion refers to uh, what happened during what is called the Svayambhuva Manvantar period. Uh, so I thought I would say a little bit about this. This is uh, related to the whole question of uh, the theory of evolution. Uh, of course, in modern scientific terms, evolution is presented as the explanation of where different forms of life have come from. So one might ask then, if uh, what is the Vedic explanation of this? So the uh, Vedic explanation is presented in, in some detail, and it's actually then the, the alternative that we would propose to the theory of evolution. So therefore, that's a matter of some importance. Uh, there's no point in saying that the theory of evolution is wrong unless you can uh, say what is the actual truth. Uh, so this description in the previous uh, chapter isn't very detailed. That does refer to uh, developments within the Svayambhuva Manu period, which is about two billion years ago began about two billion years ago at the beginning of this day of Brahma. So uh, it's an interesting description, though. It seems that after Svayambhuva Manu and his wife were manifested from Brahma, as described in the last chapter, they were actually uh, had their base of operations on the, uh, the earth uh, in India. So at that time, you had a Manu actually uh, presiding over the earth. So this was about two billion years ago. It's described that all kinds of plants and animals were there. There's the story of uh, the sage Kardama Muni, who at the time was residing at a place called Bindu Sarovara, which I understand is in what is now uh, Pakistan, uh, near where the Indus River is, is flowing. So uh, the sage Kardama Muni was meditating there, and there's a description of all kinds of different uh, plants and animals of the modern type. So that was two billion years ago at a time when, the, uh, according to the uh, modern scientific idea, uh, algae and bacteria were the only forms of life uh, existing. So, but there's not too much information there. Uh, there's a more detailed description, however, later on in the Bhagavatam, in the sixth canto to be exact, describing the process of creation. And the interesting thing to note is that at first this seems very strange, but if you think about it, you can see that it actually uh, makes sense. So I thought I'd uh, say a little bit about that. So the uh, basic principle of creation is that uh, initially, of course, Brahma is cre created from uh, Garbhodakshai Vishnu. Uh, he comes out from the uh, lotus flower coming from the navel, navel of uh, Garbhodakshai Vishnu. And from Brahma, various other kinds of living beings are generated. So this all takes place uh, on the level of the uh, heavenly planets or above, Specifically, Brahma's abode is called uh, Satya Loka. So there are, uh, that's the topmost planetary system. So that does not directly uh, um, let's deal with the situation, say, on the Earth. The Earth corresponds to uh, the middle planetary system of uh, Bhu Mandala, according to the, the Bhagavatam. So the question arises, how did different living species uh, become manifest on the, the earth? Because that would, the explanation of how that happens would be the alternative to the theory of evolution, which says that they develop gradually from chemicals and so forth uh, on the earth. 
So the basic principle is that uh, different demigods have produced different living species. Uh, this has happened in many different ways at, at different times. Uh, the story of Svayambhuva Manu is uh, an example of one occasion in which this occurred. Uh, it has to happen repeatedly because there are successive uh, annihilations or pralayas in which different living species are eliminated. So then they're again uh, created. So, uh, in particular, after every Manu period, uh, there is a pralaya, at least, I believe, according to Jiva Goswami. Srila Prabhupada points out there's some uh, controversy on that issue. In any case, we're now in the seventh Manu period. Uh, the Manu period preceding this one, the sixth one, was presided over by Chakshusha Manu. So there's an explanation in the Bhagavatam of how the different living species during that Chakshusha Manu period were uh, created. And that goes in, uh, story is given in some detail. So it's kind of uh, interesting. Uh, the story begins at a point where, uh, without really any explanation as to how it happened, uh, all human beings had vanished from the earth and the earth was covered over by trees. Uh, so, some uh, persons named the uh, Prachetas, who had been sons of a previous human king, uh, Prachina Barhisat, uh, had been meditating within the ocean for thousands of years uh, by yogic power. So they came out and found that the entire world was covered with trees. Uh, apparently there were no people around. They began to burn the trees by emanating fire from their mouths. And then Lord Brahma came down, and also Soma, the moon god who's the presiding deity of vegetation. And they uh, stopped the Prachetas from doing this. And it turns out that there was a uh, young girl living among the trees uh, named Marisha, and she was the daughter of Pramlocha, who was an Apsara. It seems that these Apsaras would have daughters in various ways, and then they would abandon them. This was their usual practice. So this uh, Marisha was being cared for by the trees, and Srila Prabhupada explained that meant by the presiding deity of the trees. Uh, so I gather that would be uh, Soma. In any case... Uh, she was given to the Prachetas as a wife, and as a result, they had a son named Daksha, who was a reincarnation of the Daksha who had been born previously as the son of Lord Brahma. Uh, Daksha was a Prajapati. He was one of the direct sons of Lord Brahma. Uh, and he had been involved previously in the creation of progeny to populate the universe, but he had offended Lord Shiva and thus he had gotten into some difficulties. So here at this point, uh, he was being born again uh, as the son of uh, the Prachetas. So there's uh, a verse saying that, uh, well, it says it's right here, his previous body had been destroyed, but he, the same Daksha, inspired by the supreme will, created all the desired living entities in the, uh, in the Chakshusha Manvantar. So, this uh, Daksha then became the creator of living beings. Apparently there was a need for living beings to be created at this stage. Uh, in any case, at least it seems evident that there were no humans around on the earth at that time. So there's a description here of how the Prajapati Daksha uh, carried out this uh, task. Uh, the first thing that he tried to do was... Uh, create with his mind. It stated here that with his mind, Prajapati Daksha first created all kinds of demigods, demons, human beings, birds, beasts, aquatics, and so on. Uh, but when Prajapati Daksha saw that he was not properly generating all kinds of living entities, he approached a mountain near the Vindhya mountain range, and there he executed very di difficult austerities. So apparently 
he tried to use this method of creation through the mind, which is what Brahma does, but it didn't work properly, although it doesn't explain here what went wrong. So he uh, performed austerities. Uh, he recited the Hamsa Guya prayers. Those are prayers to Lord Vishnu, and there's a whole section in the Bhagavatam on that. So after a long period of time, he was uh, given, um, well, Lord Vishnu appeared before him and gave him a benediction. So it's explained that actually Lord Vishnu arranged for him to have a wife so that he could produce very large numbers of uh, offspring. And there's a whole story about what happened next. Uh, he produced, uh, I think it was 10,000 sons, no known as the Haryashvas. And uh, Narada Muni came along and convinced those sons to uh, remain celibate. Uh, and seek self-realization, they were meant to populate the universe. So he then uh, produced another thousand sons called the Sabalaspas, and Narada Muni came along and convinced them also to become celibate. At this point, Daksha was fried, <laughs> uh, and he cursed Narada Muni uh, that you can never remain in one place for longer than three days. Uh, he thought this would be quite a, a terrible curse. But Narada Muni said that that would be quite all right. And uh, so then Daksha decided to produce daughters because he thought that Narada Muni wouldn't interfere in, in that case. So he produced uh, 60 daughters. So uh, they then became uh, wives of various demigods demigods were still about in the heavenly planets and they produced different uh, offspring so the description of that is rather interesting it says by the way that they uh, the descendants of these daughters filled the, all the three worlds so they uh, even though demigods were were there they produced uh, new generations of demigods also it would appear so uh, in reading this description, there are many uh, curious points, and it's uh, sort of interesting to, to look at all these points and get the, the general picture. For example, it's stated here, uh, O king, a son named Deva Rishaba was born from the womb of Banu, and from him came a son named Indrasena. From the womb of Lamba came a son named Vidyota, who generated all the clouds, it is mentioned. So we know that they're living beings connected with, with clouds. For example, there's the Sambartika cloud that uh, engages in uh, destructive activities. Uh, that was, uh, cloud was used by Indra when he was pouring down rain on the Govardhan hill. So uh, generations of clouds were produced. Uh, there are all kinds of generations descending uh, from these daughters with different names. Uh, most of these are demigods. Uh, we learn here that there are demigods called Muhurtas who descended from one of these daughters whose role is to uh, deliver actions and reactions of karma to living entities at different times of the day. It's an interesting aspect of things. Let's see. A uh, whole series of demigods. Uh, it's pointed out here that from the wife of Druva was known as Dharani. This was one of these daughters of Daksha. And from her womb, various cities took birth, it is mentioned, from which I suspect is meant uh, presiding deities of, of cities. Uh, let's see. Oh, towns. Pura. Pura. Yeah, these are... Not cities, cities. <laughs> yeah, cities took birth. It's interesting that uh, in the old days, uh, cities used to have patron saints, even in Europe. The idea was there would be a saint who would look over a particular city and uh, sort of be the guardian personality behind that. Uh, it doesn't say specifically what is meant here, but it's interesting 
Basically, the picture you see is that there are demigods everywhere, involved in everything. Uh, for every hour of the day, there are demigods who are looking after your karma during the corresponding period. Those are those muhurtas, uh, demigods of the clouds, of cities. Uh, I was looking at an interesting historical reference. The, uh, Kashmir has a, a, a local Purana associated with it called the Nilamat Purana. I suspect that's true of a lot of other places. It seems that Kashmir used to be a lake. Uh, it's, ringed by, it's a valley ringed by mountains. And right now the rivers in it flow out through a big gorge uh, at the southern part of the valley. But that gorge didn't exist at one time, apparently, and the whole thing was a lake. At least that's stated by both geologists and by this uh, Nilamat Purana. And it's, it's stated in the Purana that the lake was drained when a, uh, a demon occupied the lake. And Lord Vishnu uh, was asked by the demigods to slay the demon. So uh, he asked his brother Balaram to open up the cliffs at the foot of the lake with his plow, which Balaram did. So the lake drained out, and then Lord Vishnu slew the demon with his uh, discus. So once a valley was formed, uh, rivers naturally formed once there was a, the lake was gone. And it's described that all kinds of different demigods became the gods, or rather the goddesses of those rivers as soon as they formed. And also nagas were moved in, uh, that's a class of living beings, like Kaliya Naga is an example. Uh, and uh, Pisachas, various races came in. And then finally human beings were moved in, and so on. So you have a, a scene in which there are just demigods and different kinds of living beings associated with everything. That's the general uh, Vedic picture. It's also interesting that uh, in ancient times, even if you go back to the time of the Romans, you, you'll see that people saw things that way. Uh, so, in any case, continuing on, there are various further descriptions here. Uh, just to mention some other interesting ones. I wanted to find the one about the, uh, the constellations. In any case, the... the Moon God had 20 married 27 wives who are the uh, 27 nakshatra constellations, interestingly enough. But then we get down to the question of living entities. So all the different living species were generated from various daughters. For example, uh, Kashyapa had four wives, Vinita, Katru, Patangi, and Yamini. So Patangi gave birth to many kinds of birds. Yamini gave birth to locusts. Vinata gave birth to Garuda and then also Anuru or Aruna. Uh, Kadru gave birth to different varieties of serpents, it's described. Uh, then, let's see, oh, here the constellations are mentioned. Uh, then it's pointed out that the moon god couldn't have any children because cursed, uh, Daksha cursed him. Let's see. Then from Surabi, the buffalo, cow, and other animals with cloven hoofs took birth. Those would be the, uh, the perissodactyls, according to <laughs> modern terminology. Uh, from the womb of Tamra, the eagles, vultures, and other large birds of prey took birth. And from the womb of Muni, uh, the angels took birth. Let's see. Those are apsaras. That's what the word angel refers to here. Uh, so, also the sons born of Krodavasa were the serpents, known as Dandasuka, as well as other serpents and the mosquitoes. Uh, then various creepers and trees were born from the womb of Ela, and Rakshashas were born from the womb of uh, Surasa. So then there's a whole list. It goes on and on different kinds of species and so forth are born from the wombs of these various daughters. So one might say this seems uh, like a somewhat strange description, but actually what I'd like to propose is that this actually makes sense. Uh, if you consider, first of all, let's see, I wanted to find, 
Oh, yeah, I'll read one more. This one is interesting. Uh, there's a whole list here, but uh, Yami, one of these, this is a, a granddaughter of the of Daksha. While wandering on the earth in the form of a mare, gave birth to the Ashvini Kumaras, it's mentioned. So what apparently is happening here is that we're accustomed to the fact that a given species will produce, reproduce after its own kind. And the modern idea is that there are the genes made of DNA and so on, which are essentially the blueprints for producing uh, offspring. So uh, when reproduction takes place, the genes from the male and female are combined together, and they uh, give the uh, information for producing the developing embryo. But the genes are blueprints only for producing one kind of, of being uh, in each different species. But it would appear that the demigods had genes, if you like, uh, using that term a bit metaphorically, uh, for many different kinds of species. It's described that, uh, of course, Krishna says that he's the seed-giving father of all living uh, entities. And the word bija is used there to refer to seeds. Uh, at one point in uh, his conversations, Srila Prabhupada pointed out that these seeds are um, subtle uh, machines. He made that point. Uh, these seeds are not the souls. The soul is a different thing, completely transcendental. But these seeds are material and subtle, and they, uh, just like the seed of a tree, are the generating uh, sources of different kinds of living bodies. So Brahma was invested with all the different seeds for different kinds of living entities. And it's also described that Brahma's role is like that of a gardener. He doesn't actually create the living entities. Uh, he simply plants these seeds in the appropriate material circumstances and, so to speak, cultivates them. And then they can produce different kinds of living entities. That's the role he has. So also his role is compared to that of an engineer, since he's uh, organizing the arrangements of the different planets and so forth. So the idea would then be that Brahma would have had within his form the seeds for all the different types of living entities within the universe, described as 8,400,000. And Brahma would produce different uh, mental suns and so forth. And these would also have various of these seeds within their forms. They would produce generations of descendants, demigods and so on and so forth. So they, in turn, would have... Uh, different subdivisions of these seeds of different kinds of living entities. So finally, uh, these daughters of Daksha similarly were equipped with seed forms for different types of living beings. This is the uh, basic interpretation I'm proposing for this. So they could produce different forms of uh, organisms. Then finally, when you get down to uh, specific earthly forms, of uh, species, uh, each one of them has only one type of seed, so they can only, or one type of genes, uh, so they can only produce after their own kind. So that's one aspect of this. Uh, another aspect is that these uh, beings on the level of the demigods and so forth have uh, subtle bodily forms and they can change form according to their will. There are many different examples showing how demigods can do that. Uh, for example, in that story of King Rantidev, uh, different demigods came before him in the form of uh, different people who were begging for food, uh, including finally a Shudra and his dogs, uh, and so forth. But these uh, were demigods like Shiva and Indra, and so forth. Or another example is Maharaj Shibi, uh, met this uh, pigeon who could talk, uh, which was being chased by uh, a hawk or an eagle who could also talk. And these turned out to be demigods. They were testing the charitable nature of uh, Maharaj Shibi. Or again, when Indra and the different demigods were defeated by Bali 
in order to hide, because they'd been defeated, they assumed different animal forms, like birds and so forth. Uh, and here in the uh, verse I just referred to, this Yami, it says, was wandering on the earth in the form of a mare. So, uh, this was a goddess, but she was wandering about as a horse. And she says she gave birth to the Ashvini Kumaras. And it's interesting that Ashvini Kumara literally means young horse. Uh, but those are demigods, however. They're the uh, physicians of the heavenly planets. Yeah? What does it mean to change their forms or assume different forms? Does it mean the form is just a kind of ghost-like form that has no substance or a form that they manifest dies off and they have a, they go to another form? Or it would, Yeah, the question... Uh, is what does it mean when they change their forms? Are these forms then just ghost-like or insubstantial? Uh, as far as I can see, they have the power to affect uh, matter with their minds. So the forms they can generate are substantial and effective. Uh, but because of the power of their mind, they can then change that to another substantial form. So we have, of course, the experience that we have ideas within our minds. And sometimes those ideas are very vivid, but they're insubstantial. We can't manifest anything solid uh, on the basis of our own ideas. Although in the literature on yoga, you can read about tulpas and things that certain Tibetan yogis manifest and so forth. <laughs> That's uh, manifesting a form from the mind and who knows, perhaps a yogi could learn to do it. Demons can do it. This is not an ability limited to demigods. We have all, the case of all the different demons in Krishna's pastimes who assumed forms. It seems there that there are two different types because uh, some of the demons would pr assume a form. Uh, they would go to attack Krishna. He would kill them, and the dead body of that form would be left. For example, Agasura's dead body was left there for a whole year, it's described, and it dried up. So that serpent form was left. In other cases, Krishna would kill the being, but their original form would be left. At least that happened in the case of Putana, who appeared as a beautiful woman, and then Krishna killed her, and this horrible Rakshasha form uh, came there. Uh, so... There seem to be uh, different ways to do it, but some of the demonic associates of Kamsa were also producing substantial material forms that remained as dead bodies once they were uh, slain. So, uh, from what looking at these different descriptions, it would appear, appear that beings on the level of the demigods and also these powerful demons could generate um, substantial forms and apparently they could reproduce when in those forms. That would make sense in terms of how these different species were, were generated also. They can maneuver in subtle, in their subtle bodies and manifest a form and then leave it and go to another form. Either leave it or change it. That is, they wouldn't have to leave it in the sense of leaving a dead body, but they could change it into a different form from what I can understand. Yeah? There's also the example of Malcolm Lear and Money Green. I mean, we understand that spirit souls, at least in the material realm, which is one ten thousand people to hear. If they hear two spirit souls inhabiting heavenly bodies, if you would, then they're cursed to become trees in which they're still conscious. And then when they become manifest again, they still have those heavenly bodies. Well, there, of course, that's true. Uh, in the, but there, that's regular incarnation in a body. In other words, they were cursed by Narada Muni to take the bodies of trees. So they be actually became the souls of those trees. Uh, of course, because it was a benediction by Narada Muni, then Krishna came and liberated them. Typically, you see when Krishna liberates one of these different beings by touching him, uh, as in that case and also in the case of the lizard who was King Riga, uh, and in the case of the serpent who swallowed Nanda Maharaj, uh, Krishna would touch them and their original demigod body would become manifest.
But then, of course, Krishna can cause the body to become manifest by his will. So presumably that's what was happening. That, those weren't cases where by their own will they were assuming different forms. Rather, their souls were being put into different bodies, which is what's happened with us, too. Uh, but even though they were liberated from the tree form, they didn't assume my forms. They reassumed heavenly forms. Yeah, that's true. That's an interesting. Like the <laughs> well, that's that's interesting. That Krishna, a lot of the beings that Krishna dealt with, he didn't actually liberate them into Vaikuntha forms. Uh, he would just return them to their demigod forms, and then apparently, having learned a lesson, they had to continue with their spiritual progress. Uh, also, when Lord Vishnu liberated uh, the uh, elephant uh, Gajendra. He liberated that crocodile too, but not into a Vaikuntha form. The crocodile was given back his Gandharva body. Uh, he had got, become a crocodile because he grabbed the sage by his legs under the water. Uh, so he was cursed. Okay, you want to do that, so become a crocodile. <laughs> yeah? The, the normal duration of the demigod life, the, the life of the universe, the life of the Mahatar, uh, there are different lifespans of demigods. Some of them rule as demigods for the span of a Manvantar, Indra, for example. Uh, others, well, Brahma lasts for the whole period, obviously, of the universe. Some of the persons on Satya Loka with Brahma, it is said, become liberated at the time of Brahma. So I presume their bodies last with Brahmas during the entire span of the universe. There are lesser demigods for example, living on the moon who lived for 10,000 years, which is practically nothing <laughs> compared with these other lifespans. Yeah? You were saying about the, uh, you read about it, sometimes people charge a different opinions. They're all self-realized souls and they're all coming from the Vedas. How do they have different opinions? You know, as far as something like when the month car and how the youth is working, things like that. How they can have different opinions? Well, uh, what I gather, here's what I would just offer as speculation just before the curtains open up. Namely, we know on the heavenly planets the, the Vedas are very enormous. Millions and millions and millions of verses. So then you have pure devotees here on the earth who have tiny, super edited down versions like the Bhagavatam. Obviously, they don't have the complete story. Otherwise, you wouldn't need millions and millions of verses on the heavenly planets. Now, they're pure devotees. They're representing the disciplic succession but they're dealing with a limited part of the story. So they have some discussion as to what different things mean. That's just a brief discussion. There could be technical details, which if you had the million, million verse edition, it would all be explained. That's just a, a proposal <laughs> that one can think about. <laughs> <laughs>